with his introduction, even though it's a little uh, unusual to do that. So Tom Darden has a remarkable career. He got a bachelor's degree from the University of North Carolina and also a master in regional planning. Got his law degree from Yale. His um, 1976 un <coughs> undergraduate thesis analyzed the environmental impact of third world development and his uh, 1981 Yale thesis addressed uh, interstate acid rain pollution. So he's had a long history in uh, things environmental. He began his career with Bain and Company in Boston, 81 to 84. And then beginning in 1984, he served for 16 years as the chairman of the Cherokee Sanford Group, which curiously, I didn't know this, is the largest private brick manufacturing company. Okay, so in brick and mortar, he was on the brick side. He began investing personal capital in environmental companies before he turned to raising institutional private equity funds. Since the 1980s, he has invested in over 100 companies, and there's a long list here of green buildings and solar energy and all kinds of things, including Industrial Heat, LLC, which is, of course, seeking to commercialize uh, LENR. Tom is the founder and CEO of Cherokee and its predecessors. Cherokee has raised over $2.2 billion, invested this capital in the acquisition, cleanup, development, and sale of approximately 550 environmentally contaminated real estate assets in the U.S., in Europe, and in Canada. Tom does a lot beside his business. He's served and continues to serve on new, numerous boards. There's a long list here. Environmental Defense Action, uh, Action Fund, uh, Hospital, Wake Med Hospital, Helping Hand Mission. Uh, so he is into a lot of things beyond the um, business side of the world. He was a chairman of the Research Triangle Transit Authority, served two terms on the North Carolina Board of Transportation through appointments by the government and the Speaker of the House. So it is my uh, immense and intense pleasure to welcome Tom Darden. I'd like to begin by thanking uh, the organizers, uh, Steve and, and uh, Dave, for their hard work and also for the honor of being able to address uh, the pioneers working on this new form of energy. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to tell you the story of why we do what we do and how we perceive the work that you heroes are doing. Three years ago, I had the opportunity to meet many of you in Padua as I said that time, I'm not a scientist, I'm an entrepreneur, but we share a common inspiration in our endeavors. Business guru Peter Drucker once noted that entrepreneurship is intended as a manifesto and as a declaration of dissent. We see things that ought not to be, or we see things that ought to be but aren't, and then we dissent. But next, we go to work. Thank you for being the dissenters against the doctrines and institutions of the status quo. Our mission, like yours, remains focused on solving one of the world's biggest challenges of our time. We need energy alternatives that don't add to our pollution problems. That's the reason that we got involved in funding your research. Marginally reducing pollution by being a little bit less bad is not good enough. We need to turn back the clock. We need a gestalt shift with 7.5 billion people facing increasingly catastrophic existential threats. When we started Industrial Heat six years ago with our mandate to bring serious funding and an entrepreneurial spirit to your research, we hoped there would be a way to change the way the world's energy needs are met. In an ironic manner, we determined that the potential promise of your research was so compelling that it would be worth funding even if all we accomplished was to somehow prove that it was untrue. We believe that we could help change the way mainstream science and business perceive this sector and help lead the way toward more comprehensive environmental stewardship for our planet. I'm confident that you're going to succeed and that your work is going to be accepted. As we launch the 21st gathering of this tribe, we still need a new paradigm. Take a step back and think about why we're here and why this has been such a challenging and difficult journey. Why have some of you been chasing these elusive phenomena for almost 30 years? 
What drives that dedication, curiosity, risk-taking, and willingness to sacrifice in pursuit of what remains an evanescent and intriguing effect? Meanwhile, why are we so isolated? And has this isolation, in fact, played a positive role in these early stages of the paradigm shift? When we first looked into this sector, I was warned that this was an alluring and ca captivating pursuit and that could result in joining an isolated and dedicated community. Uh, we were warned about catching CFAS, or cold fusion addiction syndrome. <laughs> Humor aside, if we're honest with ourselves, we have to recognize that peer systems have great influence on what most of us believe and do. We observe others in our peer groups, and learn their social code along with their interpretation of the philosophical and scientific fabric that evolves into some version of truth, reality, and conformity. This can be beneficial because it allows us to create an affiliated tribe like our group here. But increasingly in society at large, our social or work communities lack diversity of thought, as evidenced by the most recent U.S. election results, the MAPS. Once we perceive what we're supposed to think, we subconsciously seek out and then we're fed data that confirms our group opinion, and we skillfully and deliberately ignore contrary facts. If we don't do this, we impair our ability to benefit from the culture around us, socially, scientifically, financially, or politically. There's a pressure to conform. This sociological conformity pressure applies to many of our belief systems, making it difficult for people to practice their pursuits while being a part of a non-conforming group. Over time, the world has become less tolerant of divergent beliefs, making it difficult for new ideas to gain traction. Meanwhile, some long accepted value systems have eroded. Have we lost the scientific rigor, self-policing, and accountability that carry the day when atomic power Space travel, supersonic flight, the computer, the internet, and recombinant DNA were discovered and har harnessed for the benefit of society. Today, can an independent thinker confront prevailing scientific or cultural norms without risking job prospects, scientific position, social status, and personal relationship opportunities even? Dan Kahan, professor at Yale, refers to this as cultural cognition, meaning that society as opposed to independent logic or reality, drives our thinking. He focuses primarily on the realms of science or technology that affect public policy, such as climate change or maybe childhood vaccines. Kahan states, a principal source of conflict over decision-relevant science is the entanglement of facts in antagonistic social meanings, which transform competing positions into badges of cultural identity. In other words, we disagree because competing cultural groups have decided to identify with certain conclusions. The correct answers are not based on facts, but on scientific, political, or cultural identity. When a particular group gains power or control, then opposing ideas face the risk of marginalization. Kahan tested subjects for scientific intelligence and for political identity and then asked science-based questions. Both right-leaning and left-leaning respondents in the United States showed similar tendencies to conform their technical opinions, their technical opinions to the thinking of their group affiliations. For example, most left-leaning subjects answered that nuclear power contributes to global warming, <laughs> even though that is logically ridiculous. While nuclear energy has drawbacks and reasonable people can debate its pros and cons, there's no doubt of its global warming benefit. Why do even intelligent liberals say that it causes global warming? The only explanation is that left-leaning cultural leaders have decided that nuclear power is negative, so it's not acceptable to say anything positive about it at all. Of course, right-leaning thinkers show similar conforming tendencies. And by the way, level of education does not change the results. This is astonishing. Kahan found that higher IQ people are just as inclined to base their conclusions on cultural conformity rather than intelligent analysis. This astonishes the intellectual class who think they use their brains to seek truth, but it's not surprising at all to normal people who have always felt that intellectuals don't have much common sense to go along with all their brains. 
Interestingly, we do see some situations where cultural conformity fails to offer a safe, consistent opinion. Old topics tend to remain in their cultural containers forever, such as gun rights in the U.S., pro-life versus pro-abortion positions, and probably cold fusion relative to the physics establishment. But new topics present dilemmas for group thinkers. Will right-leaners oppose government restrictions on artificial intelligence or machine learning or data mining, maybe new energy sources? Why didn't U.S. left-leaners oppose health care monopolies and price fixing in the same manner that they've traditionally opposed business aggregation of other forms? Will conservatives take a laissez-faire position regarding antitrust enforcement against new economy monopolists like they did relative to old industrial monopolists? It seems that people are willing to remain confused and silent until their group forms an opinion, at which time they will conform. In an ideal world, people would invite and welcome divergent opinions. Instead, we often see vitriolic and demeaning attacks on those who hold them. For example, the label denier has come to describe people who disagree not only with historical facts, but also with subjective, unclear, social, technical, and scientific beliefs. It's used to expand the distance between two opposing moral, scientific, or intellectual convictions or to ostracize the other side. Certainly there are times when we use the term legitimately and intentionally to create separation, uh, as some do when referring to Holocaust deniers. They deny an historic fact. But what if someone argues that climate science is not perfect yet or that the theory of evolution needs to evolve further? Are they deniers or are they just thinkers? Looking at this from another angle, I've served for over 25 years on the board of an historically black university where I'm almost always the only white person in the room. Years ago, someone mentioned getting pulled over by the police for DWB, or driving while black, a practice that I assumed had ended in the civil rights era. I mean, it's just so ridiculous, it, it, you can only laugh. I innocently asked if this was still a common occurrence, and I was fortunate that the nice people in the room politely smiled at my simplistic, culturally driven view. I should note that this event long predated dashboard and body cameras, which have shown the rest of us sadly what African Americans have known, have always known and had to deal with. Sensitive topics such as these often lead to shaming and in a different setting might possibly have evolved into accusations of racist denier instead of naive inquirer. Environmental advocates used climate denier to shame opponents of bureaucratic legislation to reduce carbon emissions. An environmental public relations program was built on the concept, I was part of this, that global warming science is indisputable and there could be no further discussion of the topic. I was raising my hand saying, it just doesn't sound right even, even if it's true. Many who believed carbon dioxide causes climate change were nonetheless troubled by this dismissive and vitriolic debate tactic. If anyone ever says the science is settled, be careful. The science will never be settled if we remain curious enough to learn while maintaining a desire to seek truth. Most mainstream physicists believe our science is settled and that low temperature energetic reactions that we're researching here are not possible. Followers of these mainstream opinion leaders mimic their philosophies and behaviors, further alienating those who disagree and spreading discord which increasingly stresses our scientific fabric. This holds back potential benefits and can change the status quo for the benefit of society. This cultural conformity, by the way, applies just as dramatically in companies. Bill Gates had a habit of rocking back and forth in his chair when he was in meetings during the early days of his startup. After a while, subordinates begin to exhibit, subordinates begin to exhibit the same unusual habit of, of rocking back and forth. Microsoft meetings became filled with with conformists uh, uh, doing the same thing as the boss, probably subconsciously. While this is a silly example, we regularly see accusations of discrimination against New York investment banks, Silicon Valley VCs, and large tech companies. Their inherent discrimination is based on cultural groupthink. We all need to contemplate and avoid this as our small sector continues to evolve and mature. So what does this mean to this gathering? How do we interpolate and act based on what we know about ourselves? There's story after story of discovery, rejection, perseverance, verification, replication, and ultimately ubiquity. The airplane, the automobile, the laser, space travel, and more. 
The leading thought groups of the day have consistently resisted new invention, breakthroughs, and change. Now it's our turn to change our status quo. How can we learn from others who converted their rejection into usefulness? They were able to move through stages of progression that brought their discoveries into common acceptance. Mainstream academia, science, and government stall the first wave of cold fusion discovery. Next March will be 30 years since the announcement that launched this field. We owe it to the early pioneers and to our planet to responsibly finish this work and move the discussion into the mainstream of science, academia, and industry. How do we move forward from our isolation? We need theory that can direct basic, repeatable, and understandable experiments. We need experiments and papers that will be replicated and accepted by mainstream physicists and science communities and publications. We need to trust but verify and commit to absolute honesty in our research. We need a new level of self-accountability as we prepare for a move into the mainstream. The universe may be ready to share another layer of physical and scientific mystery with those who are willing to see and hear. The barriers created by our social and scientific orders are going to be challenged. First principles research needs to replace incomplete and sometimes shoddy methodologies. With this, we will overcome the bias and barriers that have kept our field from becoming useful to the planet. We can fix this. Before I close, I'd like to thank the many dedicated and honest researchers who've worked with us in our quest to find the truth over the last six years. We thank you for trusting us and look forward to reaching a starting point where a broader community can begin to understand this anomaly that has the potential to eliminate pollution. We look forward to an ongoing relationship with you, to living each day with courage, to continued progress, mutual accountability, and to eventual success. To the group, let's find ways to work together. Let's encourage replications and be willing to accept results and data sets which fail to confirm a replication. In conjunction with any proclaimed discoveries, let's also admit our mistakes and make data from failed experiments available for others to analyze. With that, a broader trust and credibility can begin to emerge. Let's live each day with courage, learn from each other, do the right thing, be respectful in the process, talk less and say more, and be tough but fair while we strive to move this field beyond the fringe with the conviction and common goal of saving our planet. Humanity needs for us to succeed. Thank you and God bless.